And you guys are on. Hey guys, happy Thursday. I have Melissa here with me from Blonzies. And so she has two restaurants. She has one in Lake Havasu and one in Oregon. Um, I think it is safe to say that when I left your community spotlight, me and Jeff were just like, oh, she's so cool. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that is two different spotlights for sure. It may even be three. I don't know. So A, thank you for letting us go out and spotlight you. Well, and thank B, you. I am so excited that you're here with us today. Well, yeah, thank welcome you so to the show. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so I'm excited. Uh, I feel like with the community spotlights, we were able to share a little bit of her with you guys out there in the community. But today will be a whole different ball game. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. <laughs> the rest of the story. Yes. So, um, obviously, you own two restaurants, but I would really like them to s hear a little bit about your backstory and kind of where it started. I mean, really, as a child. Right. Um, that's where we all start. Yeah. Um, my childhood was very unique. I was raised on the rifle range. My father was the coach of the shooting team, and I was expected to to be the best, do your best always. And yeah. um, I remember when I was 12 years old, I asked my dad, can I get my ears pierced? And he said, you have to get first place in the United States first, and then you can get your ears pierced. Of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, to say it out loud, it sounds crazy, but at the time, I, well, okay, that's what I gotta do. It took me about a year and a half. I was 13 when I took my first national title and I got my ears pierced. Um, so then, then shooting became a lot more fun. Um, so when you say shooting, Let's explain to them what you're shooting. Okay. Um, it's precision target shooting, indoors and outdoors, uh, 22 rifle and air rifle. That's what my titles are in. I did shoot handgun, but not very well. So um, rifle shooting was, was my sport. And once I got to the national level, then a lot of that changed. Um, it didn't, it wasn't work as so much as it was fun. I got to travel. Um, I had the opportunity to stay at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs for one summer. And, and you know, as a kid, they teach you that the body can achieve what the mind can believe. And I just, I just embraced that and just thought, well, that, I mean, that's why I feel like if the Hard Rock Cafe can do it, then I can do it. So yeah. that's, um, that's why I am the way I am is because of being raised on the rifle range and having that that discipline, um, the drive, mm -hmm. and it was, it was so much practice. I mean, no bird, you didn't get to go to birthday parties. You didn't get to go do anything, any other sport. I wasn't allowed to go like, um, snow skiing cause I could break something or, um, you know, they were everything, everything had to do with just shooting and, and being better at it. Yeah. Um, when I was, uh, 17, um, my senior year in high school, um, came home from school. I was sick. I was really sick. I was thrown up all the time. And my dad said, you know, you need to go to the doctor. Something's wrong. And it was a beginning to affect my shooting because I, I just kept throwing up. I didn't know what was wrong. And, and um, went to the doctor. And um, the doctor came out and he said, you're pregnant. And that to me was a huge surprise. Um, I was on birth control pills and I didn't know that antibiotics had made birth control ineffective and I had been given antibiotics a month prior. So um, that was uh, April 27th, 1990. And at this time you had a scholarship. That was the same day that I got the scholarship. I came home from the doctor appointment and I had the confirmation of pregnancy in my pocket. And I was gonna tell my dad, I was, I turned up pop don't preach all the way home from the doctor and <laughs> rehearsed all the different ways I was going to tell him, but I was going to tell him. Um, I had two weeks until I turned 18 and um, I knew that my dad would want me to have an abortion, but I also, I, th I thought I could talk him out of it and explain it to him. I didn't really, um, I didn't it wasn't really know. an option for you. It wasn't an option for me. Um, that, that afternoon when I got home, I had that confirmation of pregnancy in my hand and my dad was home early that day. He never came home early, but that day he was there early and he had gotten the mail and in the mail was a letter. And when I got out of my car and walked up to the, my front porch, my dad came bursting out the front door and he's jumping up and down. He's screaming. He's like, Oh my God, you did it, kid. You did it. You did it. You did it. I'm so proud of you. 
and he's waving this paper. And I'm looking at him going, what the hell is he talking what about? You know, I'm like, I had no idea what he was talking about. And so I was like, what? And he said, I just got off the phone with the coach. We're going to go to parents weekend, May 5th and 6th. Um, they're so excited to have you. They, they want you to be their team captain. You know, you've already lettered. Um, and I'm like, what? And I said, can I see that? And I looked at the letter and as soon as I saw the letter head, I knew I was in trouble. Um, the scholarship was an amazing scholarship. It was a four year full ride to Oregon State University. It was what I had been raised to do. Um, my dad did not care about the Olympics near as much as he cared about free college. Yeah, that's what, was a plan. Yeah, brick and mortar. Um, I was, you know, taught you, you go to brick and mortar college and or you won't be successful. And we're going to you know, put these, all these years in of practice and practice and practice and comp competition after competition uh, to get to brick and mortar free college. That was, that was what Your I was raised was for. Yes. So when I looked at the letter head, the letter was from the United States Navy. And in the letter it said I needed to go and have a physical and I couldn't have a dependent. And I knew that I would fail that physical. So, um, actually, I crumbled that letter up in my pocket and I stuffed it down in the bottom of my pocket and I didn't tell him. And we went to Parents Weekend on May 5th and 6th in, at Oregon State University. Uh, we walked through, they had a big parade, it was, it was horrible. Um, they took me to, you know, this is going to be your library, this is going to be your dorm, this is going to be your shooting range, and I kept thinking, this is never going to be my library, this is never going to be my dorm. I, I can't even say it, I can't say it. It was, it was horrible. Um, so I couldn't find the words, I didn't tell him. Um, I didn't tell him until the day after graduation, um, in, in June. By then I was starting to show, and the baby was moving, and it was affecting my shooting, because I was, I was trained to shoot in between heartbeats. And when you got a baby kicking and moving you. There was more than one heartbeat. It was, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so then um, I knew that when I told him that he was a very much, you made your bed, you lie in it. Um, and then I was on my own. I learned what food stamps were. I learned that churches give out boxes of food to people like me that I had just donated to six months prior. And um, I went from having everything to having nothing, and from being a child to having a child. And it was rough. It was rough. Yeah. Um, everything you knew, thought, were mm -hmm. raised to do. Yep. Not only were you not doing that, but you were doing it on your own. Right. So now I'm in survival mode, and um, thinking about how to survive without that. I knew that the brick and mortar college was off the table. And really the only thing that I could do um, was waitressing. Waitressing, Oregon doesn't have a server wage. So uh, minimum wage is, right now it's 1350. So all the servers uh, there, um, bartenders, you know, you can do really well. Yeah. And that's what I did to survive um, was wait tables. And, and I loved it. I loved being a waitress. It was, um, I never had any, never had any shame in it. I was very proud. Um, you built yourself a community mm -hmm. by being you. Yeah, and I loved waitressing. I always, I always have. Um, I still, I still do it. You know, if somebody comes into the restaurants and and they needed their order taken, heck yeah, I'll take their <laughs> order, bust a table, do whatever. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it was, it was a rough start. Um, so at some point, you started to believe that you could be the business owner. Yeah. Um, fast forward. I got to fast forward um, about 13 years. And then um, I went through, um, I had gotten married to, and it was an abusive relationship and gotten out of that and was working at this little diner with the three kids, single mom. And I met my husband, now Mark. And after we got married, I bought Blonzi first, but then after we got married, um, he asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? Are you going to be a waitress forever or what? He wasn't saying it like to be mean. He was just saying it like, what do you want to do? Yeah. I feel like you could be more than this. You know, <laughs> you could do more. Uh, what do you want to do? I was like, well, let me think about it, pray about it and give it some time. About a month later, 
I went back to my husband. I said, I know what I want to be when I grow up. And he was like, okay, what's that? I said, okay, I want to be a restaurant owner, but I don't want just one. I want restaurants all over the world, like the Hard Rock Cafe, that aren't close together, <laughs> that are theme restaurants named after my car. I want everyone to want yeah. to go there. <laughs> and he was like, oh my God, how the hell are you going to do that? And I said, well, I'm going to have to quit my job here at the little diner and get a job at a big restaurant. Um, so in 2006, I did. I, I quit the job at the little diner, got a job. It was actually yesterday was the anniversary of that day, um, 17 years ago. I got the job at that restaurant that I own now. And I worked really super hard, worked my way up to uh, manager, bar manager, restaurant manager, saved my tips for nine and a half years. And we purchased it from my boss in 2015. Wow. Yeah. Saved your tips, came up with a plan, single mom, new life. Yeah. And you had a car. Yeah. Blonzi. Um, <laughs> but Blonzi, um, when I was working at the diner from a customer, um, we were talking dream cars, and he'd come in and said, you know, one day after I told him that I wanted a 69 Z28, it had to be a Z28. It had want, to be. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want an RS or an SS or a clone. I was, of course you knew exactly yeah, what you I wanted. I knew exactly that car right there. There she is. That's Blonzi. Look uh, at her. So uh, this customer came in, and he said, hey, I brought you a dream car, and he's holding up the keys. And I was looking out there on the side. I'm like, oh my God, there she is. No way. You know, no way. Is this and, for real? And yeah. Is this for real? I said, how much? And he's, and I, well, first I asked him, is it a real Z? And he said, yes. I said, can you prove it? <laughs> he said, yeah, it comes with all the documentation, including the bill sheet. Okay. How much? He said, you can have it for what I paid for it. Okay. Well, how much? He says, 12,500. 12, I stick my hand out, shake stand. <laughs> Is he like, what are you? And then, like, yeah. <laughs> for real? Yeah. And then he just, then he dropped the keys and he looked at me and he goes, no way. And his friend starts laughing. He's like, dude, I told you this was going to happen. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And he looks at me and he goes, are you serious? And I said, well, yeah, I'm serious. That's my dream car. I'll get you the money tomorrow. And he just said, but you're just a waitress. Hmm. And then I realized he was just jerking with me and I stuck my hand right out there. I just held it there. Yeah. I'll get you the money tomorrow. You don't need to worry about where coming from i had to borrow it but i knew it could and uh, his name never touched the title he sold it to me the next day for 12 five he didn't have to but he did it was awesome um, and now she's not for you know she's not for sale she's she's priceless to me hey she's a piece of your family right yeah yeah she's um, something that i had to focus on um she's something that you can see and touch and and feel and something that you know she's this just the ultimate symbol of blood sweat and tears for me um yeah and so then I always knew that I wanted the restaurants named after her, theme restaurants. And so then um, during that nine and a half years of saving my tips and had a lot of years to dream, if this were my restaurant, what would I do? And my husband had talked about a, a thesis that he did in college where he had um, designed a restaurant that had a glass case with a car in it. And I was like, okay, well, let's do that. But instead of having a car in it, let's use the customer's cars. So um, each month it's a different car that's in front of the restaurant and each customer gets a drink named after them in the bar for the month. They get a calendar with their car on it. And as soon as I had it built, the waiting list in Salem, Oregon, where it rains every day was three years long. So Can we just talk about the fact that these glass boxes are just not something that you see anywhere, everywhere. Right. You actually worked hard. You had this idea, you got it patented and mm -hmm. now it's yep. yours. Yep. I got a United States patent on it. The patent pending process um, took, it actually takes a couple of years to do that. It's, it's a lot. It's, it's not very simple. Oh, that's my most famous car. That's the little dead wagon from the television show, uh, Graveyard Cars. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool having that thing in there. I thought it was going to break the glass. It was so loud. It's got a thousand horsepower. It's oh really, it's really cool though. So right now in Oregon, you have the garage up and that mm -hmm. happens every month. Every month. We'll get to and we are working on the Have Sue store. Yes, I've been to Kingman four times to try and get the building permit there. There is no glass garage building permit. There's only one in the whole world and it's in front of my other restaurant. So normally when a restaurant goes to, to get a building permit, it's for like outdoor seating or Normal kitchen things. remodel, you know, new hood or something. <laughs> they yeah. have all the answers. Right, it's not for a, a glass garage for customers to show off their cars. <laughs> um, to get, I had to go to Indiana to get the insurance. Um, I was told, you know, from the very beginning that you can't do that. Um, when we went to Marion County, Oregon to apply for the building permit 
for the original glass garage the guy at the desk he said you can't do that and i was like well why not it's a display it's marketing it's a sign and he said no you can't do that that's um that's got that's an addition to your restaurant you're going to need extra parking extra seating permission from the liquor commission permission from lottery permission from fire marshal you're gonna have to bring your building up to 2018 code you're gonna have to get all new windows all new siding and and if you do all that then you have to use a super expensive hurricane type glass and I was so mad. I couldn't get past the guy. He was the computer guy in the in the window, and I couldn't get past him to get the permit because um, he just would type in his computer, and it and it didn't fit in the box. It didn't fall under any category. Right. It didn't fit in the box, and I fought with that guy for six weeks, and I couldn't get past him. And I was like, God, there's got to be another way. Again, think about it, pray about it, give it some time. So I went down to the glass company in Salem, and I asked to talk to the boss because the the extra parking, extra seating, the the bringing the building up to code and stuff, you know, I could, I could probably do all that stuff, but it was, it was the glass that really ticked me off because it was a lot of money and I wanted not that stupid expensive glass. So I, that's why I went to the glass company and I asked, how thick is the glass at Mercedes showroom floor in South Salem where the car spins around in front of the glass? How thick is their glass? And then I asked him, what about Harley Davidson? They are one exit South on I-5 from my restaurant and they have windows all the way around with motorcycles in front. How thick is their glass? Well, let's talk about the business right next door to me. It's called Psycho Country. They sell side-by-sides and um, jet skis, stuff like that. And they have glass all, the whole along the front of their windows. And they all had a quarter-inch plate glass. So I went with half-inch tempered. Then I asked the glass company boss, what's the cheapest way to buy it? And that's why the glass garage is the, is the 24 by 12. It's because of the... Um, you could buy it in the sheets. The biggest expense in the glass was cutting it. So if I could use the sheets yeah. of glass that come standard, it would be cheaper. Because, you know, I'm not Apple yet. I don't have that kind of money. And this is something that I had to earn as I went. Right. It was $100,000 to build that thing. <sighs> yeah. So um, after that, we went to the metal company and had them put more rebar in it than the Salem Hospital parking structure has per inch and the four corner posts sunk five and a half feet underneath the ground before you can even see them. So we made it overkill on purpose with yeah. this basically bulletproof, hurricane proof, earthquake proof. It's not going anywhere. So then we took the plans to Oregon State Building Codes. And I still, I can't believe this works still. Sometimes I just, I can't <laughs> believe it worked. So I walked into Oregon State Building Codes and the same thing, you know, can I talk to your boss? I'm trying to do something that's never been done anywhere in the world and Marion County keeps refusing my permit. So the guy comes down, his name's Rex, and I tell him the whole story. I tell him, you know, the, the started as a waitress and that I named it after my car and Blonzie's my car and why I wanted the glass garage for the customers of the community to show off their cars. And I told him about the calendars. They each get a calendar with their car on it every year. They get a drink named after them in the bar for the month and, and, um, and what, you know, what it was for and why, yeah. why I wanted to do it and that I wanted more than just one restaurant. And he listened to everything I had to say, and he just got this big smile on his face, and he said, that's the most brilliant marketing plan I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> They're like, yes, yes. thank and, you. Yes, and he said, you know what, um, I'm going to give you a U occupancy rating. Well, I didn't know what that meant, and he said, that means that no customers can eat or drink inside the glass garage. Um, it's a display, and he said, you know, he said, let me just call Marion County and make it crystal clear for them. So he calls Marion County right in front of me, and he's like, hey, I'm standing here with Melissa Lucas, who's trying to get this glass garage building permit. Um, I'm giving her a U occupancy rating, which means that she will not have customers eating or drinking inside the glass garage, which means that she won't need permission from Oregon Lottery or OLCC. Um, she's not going to need permission from the fire marshal because nothing's flammable. It's concrete, metal, and glass. Um, and then he said, this was my favorite part, he said, there's no Marion County law that says she has to have a flower bed there. She's putting it in an existing flower bed. She's exempt. Push her through. And he hung up the phone. And I was like, really? yes, Holy, did that just happen? It was the most epic <laughs> moment of my grown up life. I was so, yeah, I grabbed those plans and drove straight from Oregon State Building Codes back to Marion County. This time they let me upstairs and I was issued a special permit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so they were all over my case about that, um, you know, the construction of the glass garage. They were there checking everything. And on the electrical, we had to hire our own inspector. We had an inspector, inspection on the inspection. For the electrical but yeah. but we dotted all the i's crossed all the t's i had the patent attorney that i've been working with for the past nine months on standby and as soon as i got my final final okay from marion county i called the patent attorney and said let's go i'm in yeah <laughs> so taking no for an answer obviously 
just mm -mm. isn't your your cup of tea. That truck right there, I named his drink the Step Side. Um, he was the perfect example of of what the glass garage was for. Um, you know, you put your vehicle on display in front of my restaurant. How many times are you going to come that month? Every all right? the time. Yeah. And bring your you're friends. Talk about it. You're going to show right? it off. And take pictures <laughs> and put it on your Snapchat. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Yeah. So that guy, his name is Lloyd. Um, he asked me, can I have my, my truck in there for September? Because it's my special month. I'm like, sure. So, you know, guess who had his birthday party with 18 of his friends <laughs> during his special month yeah. and his anniversary party. And yeah, he was there damn near every day ordering the step side. And um, I made it match the truck. It was that color with a whipped cream on top to it match that green and white. And <laughs> Jeff, do you have that picture that of was, the drink? <laughs> Gen genius marketing. <laughs> yeah. It, it works, you I know? Mean, I mean, it's and it's super fun when it's your vehicle on display and you see people like lining their kids up in front of it and taking pictures of it and selfies in front of it. Oh, see, there's another one. That, uh, that car was, uh, that was a little more difficult because it was different colors. And so I had to make the drink all the colors um, that had flames and stuff on it. <laughs> But yeah, they're all unique. Genius. Each customer has their uh, their own unique vehicle, you know. And so they all have a story. I always talk to the customers and try and find out, you know, what they like to drink and if they if their car has a name. Like right now, we have a '66 Nova in there. That's the name of the car is called the Evil Queen. Ooh. So we named her drink the Evil Queen. It's a, <laughs> owned by a woman, and yeah, it's a it's just super fun. So uh, that's what the glass garage is about. That's what it's for. That's why um, I'm in Lake Havasu. After the glass garage patent pending attorney called me and said, um, hey, you've got the patent pending secured. So then I posted on my personal Facebook that I was looking for land for Blonsie's number two. I was looking for dirt. I was not looking for a 10,000 square foot existing restaurant. I was just looking for land. So I Googled um, the number one registered show cars per capita and it was Lake Havasu City. I had never been to Lake Havasu City. I'd never even heard of it. I'd heard of Lake Havasu, but I didn't of know there was a Lake Havasu City. You, yeah, right? so I didn't know anyone there. Um, but I added it to my list. I'm like, there's there's like three locations. Reno Tahoe um, is one that I still can't wait to go to Nevada. Um, my third location will be in Nevada. And in Nevada, I'm allowed to have 28 poker machines. In Arizona, I don't have any. So it's a lot easier to make money off a of video poker and chicken yeah. fried steak. So, fried steak. you know, um, <laughs> Tahoe has the is more of the retirement community. Reno is hot August nights, big car following. Also Laughlin, super tempting. But so I put on my um, post, Reno, Tahoe or Scottsdale because they have um, Barrett Jackson there mm. or like Havasu City because I wanted a third one. And that's why I had Googled number one registered show cars. So five minutes after that Facebook post, my high school comment, my high school classmate comments on it. I'll quit my job and come work for you if you build in like Havasu. I'm like, hmm. So find me some land and we'll talk. Again, <laughs> dirt. I'm thinking 30, 40 grand, something I can make payments towards while I'm, because I got a lot going on in Salem. You know, I've, I've only owned that restaurant for three years. The glass garage has just got built. Blonzie's sitting in the glass garage. It's the first month it's open. So right after that, um, he, he comments with the link and he sends me the link to the Golden Horseshoe on London Bridge Road in Lake Havasu. So I click on that link and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> this place is this amazing is <laughs> this is amazing and it could be so much more so I call the realtor and I'm just I'm on the phone for 20 seconds I'm how long has it been on the market I find it's been on the market for two and a half years two and a half years wow. so that tells me there's something wrong or and a motivated seller but something's probably wrong and then I asked what are the sales and he tells me 1.2 million so now I'm, I'm no hmm, now I'm like, curious yeah what's wrong with something's this place, right? wrong like food <laughs> management location what is it why has it been on the market for two and a half years and why are their sales so low? What's going on? So I send the link to my sister. My sister is in Washington, DC. Um, my sister did get the shooting scholarship and brick and mortar and become successful. So um, she had worked at the oil company in Alaska for 20 years before moving to um, Washington, DC at the HR representative. And she sent the link to her old boss, who's the CFO of the oil company in Alaska, um, because she knew he had a house in Lake Havasu City. And she sent him the link to my first restaurant and said, hey, um, this is my little sister's restaurant. She just built this glass garage in front of it. She's got this three year long waiting list. She's looking at Lake Havasu for her second location. And then she sends him the link to the Golden Horseshoe. Have you ever been here? Do you know about this place? Um, the CFO immediately calls her back. And he's like, oh my God, give me Melissa's phone number. I need to talk to her right now. So. <laughs> 
Now, here's the thing. The CFO is a rifle shooter. So I've actually been competed. He was so the girls don't shoot against the boys most of the time. Um, so he was, you know, a boy and he was older. So I didn't compete against him directly, but he knew exactly who I was. You so have been at the same place. Yes, and when you're at the international level in shooting, you know there's not a whole lot of girls from Oregon that are national champions. So and he can, or girls right, per se. I right, would true. <laughs> yeah. So he didn't know. I mean, he knew who I was, but he didn't know my, know my phone number or anything. So that's why he called my sister and said, "Give me Melissa's phone number. I need to talk to her right now." So now I'm like 15 minutes after my Facebook post <laughs> and the CFO from the oil company in Alaska calls me and he's oh, like, wow. oh my God, Melissa, that restaurant needs you so bad. When can you come down here? You can stay at my house. I will help you. When can you come down here? And I was like, whoa. <laughs> Catching a flight. <laughs> <laughs> whoa. And I'm like, hold on. And I was like, what's wrong? Why? Why, yeah. Why has it been in the market for two and a half years? What's going on? Why do they need me so badly? And that's when he tells me that the previous owner had passed away. He actually had a heart attack inside the restaurant and was life flighted to Phoenix and passed away. And his widow put it in the mar on the market. Two and a half years. People were trying to buy it. But it, not, none of the people could buy it. So, so now I'm really super curious. And, if, and I, so I, I book a flight. Two weeks later, I'm knocking on the CFO's front door. And... 20 minutes after that, I'm sitting in the restaurant with the seller and the CFO and the CFO's realtor and uh, her realtor. And I'm walking through going, oh my God, this place could be so much more. You know, they were only, uh, why are you only open for dinner? Why don't you do breakfast and lunch? Uh, why don't you have a coffee station? Why, why are you making coffee by the cup? People in Arizona don't drink coffee. Um, it was just so different yeah. than they just, they had, why is your menu only one page? Like it was just like a one piece of paper menu that had menu on front and back. And it was, and my menu is like eight pages, you know, I'm, I'm, it's just so different. So foreign from what I know, but it's also so cool and it could be so much more. And for what I'm trying to do, it's perfect. And we know you like a challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did not think the bank was going to loan us another one and a half million dollars. It'd only been three years. Um, since we borrowed the first one and a half million, um, I, I, I never thought that that we would be able to pull it off. Um, but the more that I asked, and the more that I looked at it, and the the, the more the pieces started to fall into place. Um, and, and honestly, you know, if, if it hadn't happened to me, I wouldn't believe it myself. It the way that it all happened was incredible. If I'm going to stay at anybody's house, first of all, the CFO of the oil company. <laughs> that guy, that's the house I want to stay at because his job is to oversee the sale and purchase of hotels, restaurants, and gas stations that the oil company owns. So he's brilliant and right I can ask him all the right questions and he's just guiding me through the whole thing. And then um, the problem, you know, why, why weren't the other people able to purchase yeah. the restaurant? So... The listing had said, um, in little teeny tiny letters at the bottom, it said 1.2 million for this 9,376 square foot restaurant on three acres. In little tiny letters on the bottom, it said 300,000 for duplex on adjacent property. So I'm in Oregon, right? So I pull up Google Maps and I'm looking around for the duplex and I'm thinking we're talking about like a 70s mobile home. And I don't care. I honestly, I do not care. I just need a place to sleep. So I have no idea what the duplex is and don't care, but it sounds awesome because it has a place to sleep. Yeah, it's right there. You're I got to have a place to sleep. It. Yeah. And it comes and like, just, you could, it comes with the duplex. And so CFO does this, the homework on the land with me. And we find out that both buildings are on one tax ID, one piece of property, all three front doors, same address, mm -hmm. one tax ID, and they're owned by one S Corp. Now I understand what that means. You, you should never put buildings in an S Corp. You should always have the protection of an LLC and then lease the LLC needs to lease the buildings to the business. So each month I write a check to landlord me and then landlord me pays the bank because they're two different entities. things. They're two different entities. Yes. And I had learned that at the Oregon restaurant because I'd already set it up that way. So once I learned that the buildings were both in one S Corp, that means that the business, when you sell the business, um, owns both buildings as much as it owns the tables and chairs and cups and spoons. It's, it's a, just a 
a thing, a piece of it. A piece of it. And, yeah. and so when I'd asked about the duplex, the seller was said, how did you know about that? You know that, and she tells the realtor, you weren't supposed to include that. And she, she had wanted to sell the duplex separately. Separate. She wanted to sell it like herself. And so I asked her why, yeah. you know, what's your reason? Cause I knew that they were one thing and I wasn't quite understanding what, why? So I just asked her, what's your reason? You know, why, why do you, do you want to live back there? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to live back there while somebody else runs your restaurant? Cause I can't do it without a place to sleep. And she said, no, that's not it at all. That her reason was the realtor. She didn't want the realtor getting a commercial cut of her house. She wanted to sell the house separately herself. Oh, okay. So then I was like, um, will you show me? And she, she said she didn't want him selling her dream house. And I was like, dream house? Because I'm thinking we're talking about something. Yeah, like, little, you know, little. Originally, there was a 70 single white mobile home back there. They tore it down. They were grandfathered in. They built a 4,500 square foot, beautiful <laughs> dream house duplex with a pool, waterfall into the pool from the hot tub, stone floors. That's what's sitting behind the restaurant. Uh-huh on the commercial land. So as soon as I saw the dream house, I was like, Oh my God, you can't do that. Okay. Now I understand the problem. So then I asked her, how can I help you? What is it that you need? How yeah. can we do this? And she wanted, she told me that she wanted, she wanted it to not fail. She wanted to go to somebody that had passion. Who loved it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I got that covered. That's, hey, that's not a problem. What, that's <laughs> yeah, I got that part done. And then uh, she, she wanted to know that it wasn't going to fail. And she wanted to walk with a million bucks after all said and done. Okay. You know, so who's your CPA? That's not my CPA. Who's your bank? Now that's my bank. You got some tough questions like capital gains tax. And yeah. what does it mean when you put buildings in an S corp instead of an LLC? Um, and I called her bank and I called her CPA and told them what the problem was and that, um, I told the bank that I was going to come back in a week and I was going to ask him to borrow a million and a half dollars. And, uh, I had already booked a trip to Vegas the week before. I'm just faking my way through all this, right? <laughs> so I'm like, just pray I'll, be, it I'll, works. Be, I'll be back in a week. <laughs> I'm just going to ask you. For, and so I give him, I give the bank, um, the, my, here's my tax ID. Here's my social security. Here's my business in Oregon. Here's my bank in Oregon. You know, please do your homework on me. I'm going to come back in a week and ask you to borrow some money. Yeah. Um, so a week later, uh, I went into the bank and I brought 10,000 cash with me because I learned that on my very first poker machine deposit, that if you deposit $10,000 in cash, the bank is forced to do federal paperwork on you. I had no idea. So I, that's why I chose that number and I put it in, it was all twenties. It was like a brick of twenties. I just set it on this desk and I said, I'd like to open a bank account with that $10,000 and I'd like to ask you for, to borrow one and a half million. And he looked at me and he goes, you had me at hello. I was like, what? You're like, hold on. Yeah. Um, so I, I went to the seller and I offered her 1.495 for the 3.1 acres, the 10,000 square foot restaurant, the liquor license, the 4,500 square foot duplex, um, the business, the food, the equipment, the boat, and the truck. And she said yes in five seconds. She just wanted Ooh. to be heard. She wanted to mm -hmm. feel safe. She wanted, and you took the moments. Yep. And then she took her one and a half million and, and built a dream house and she hugged me and said thank you for giving my life back to me on oh. on that day and and then uh and then the battle began so let's just do a little recap a uh, young single mom waitress work very hard spend nine years of your life saving the money to buy your dream restaurant find an amazing man build your family easy that's comfy right. And then you hit have a suit. Right. <laughs> so you get through this hurdle. You get your your blonde, your second blondie restaurant mm -hmm. functioning. You know, learning that have a suit is a different place for sure. Yes, um, that was hard. Have a suit was really hard. Uh, when I opened the Oregon restaurant, I had tremendous support from the community. Um, one thing that our restaurant does is we feed anyone in need for free on Thanksgiving. We open up our doors. It's something we've done forever and as long as I'm alive we'll continue to do so um, the Oregon restaurant is uh, has been doing that for years it was something that my boss had done for years there and it was something that I want I adopted immediately and I wanted to do as part of the restaurants all over the place to do uh, free Thanksgiving I call it thankful and giving day um, but something to you know give back to the community I'm a firm believer if you take care of your people they'll take care of you 
yeah. take care of employees. Well, and community. in all honesty out there, they watched you struggle. They watched you work for nine years. They, mm-hmm. you know, sat at your tables many, many times. I'm sure they knew your story and knew how amazing you were and, you know, got to kind of see you grow right. as a mom, a wife, and kind of transition into a business owner. Mm-hmm. And um, over 200 customers have come 1,100 miles just to see this restaurant. That's from my other restaurant. Oh, we're almost at 300. It's it's <laughs> it's amazing to you know, have that kind of support. Yeah. Um, like Havasu, I didn't know anyone except for the CFO. I didn't know anyone, and um, and I was met with opposition um, uh, from the beginning, and I didn't I didn't understand why. Like, you know, the county should be welcoming new businesses. Yeah, why don't you want me here? Mm-hmm. That's certainly what it felt like. Um, I had a had issues with the health department on my very first day. Um, the health inspector came in and was only in the building for just a handful of minutes and said, I'm shutting your doors. And that was, you know, I had just signed my life away for another one and a half million yeah. dollars. To a functioning restaurant. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they right. were running a restaurant out of the exact same building. Right. And it had been legal and um, existing and, and open. So it was her restaurant one day, it was mine the next. And I didn't want the employees to move, to lose any time. So um, we, it was literally hers one day, it was mine the next day. Kind of came in the back door there. But right before we, we opened, the health inspector comes in and she says, I'm shutting your doors. And I'm like, I'm so confused. Why? Why would you shut my doors? I was in your office on Friday. You told me it was no big deal to come in because she said that she couldn't give me the food license until they inspected the restaurant after it was mine. But they had just been there two weeks prior, and there was uh, they had the restaurant had got an excellent rating, and I actually you know pointed on the wall. There's a sign right there that says, "You were here two weeks ago, and they got an excellent." Why would you shut my doors? And she said, "Well, it's not safe." I'm like, "Well, what's not safe?" She said, "Your hand washing sinks are 27 feet apart, and there's this new rule; they have to be 25 feet apart." So we're shutting your doors, and I'm like, "What?" I said, you can't do that. You can't, you cannot grandfather in for food safety. This isn't my first day. You know, I've already bought a restaurant and this was existing. You should should change his hands. Um, I want to talk to your boss. So she put her boss on the phone and I talked to him and said, you know, you can't do this. You you can't shut my doors. I I just borrowed one and a half million dollars to buy this place. I gave every employee a $3 an hour raise. All of them. Like I want to be successful. I want for the community, for myself. We're, yeah, we're going to do this free Thanksgiving thing next month. Um, we're just, so I didn't understand like wh- why, what the problem was and, yeah. and why it wasn't, it was safe in the morning. And then as soon as I signed my name, it's not safe, you know? So, yeah. um, so the boss, he said, and I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I won't shut your doors, but you're going to have to use the previous owner's name, menu, license and hours. So that the right one there, page menu. Mm-hmm. well, that right there is, is, um, is breaking a federal law. Those licenses are non-transferable. Like you can't take my license and open a taco truck with it. Right. Um, so by having me work under the golden horseshoes name, that wasn't a thing that wasn't, I, I just didn't see that coming because it wasn't something that everywhere else in America that you can't do that. Um, but do you want to sue the health inspector in a town you own a restaurant in? No. Nope. So. And you don't quit easy, mm-mm. as we know. And, you know, I cried about it. I talked to my husband. You know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, and um, Mark just said, we're just going to play their game. We're going to do what they want us to do. So so we brought water to walls that never had water. Uh, we jackhammered through the concrete slab and put drains that never existed in. Um, took took all the money that I had for opening. Um, I, w- I went, it was just extreme stress. Um, I... I didn't see that one coming and I wasn't prepared for it. And it was really, I mean, can you imagine working so hard and getting so close and borrowing all that money? And then you have to say, welcome to the Golden Horseshoe. And here's their menu, a menu I I was completely unfamiliar with. I wasn't allowed to serve pancakes or, um, you know, anything that I did uh, until we got those sinks in because I was working under somebody else's name, menu, license, and hours. so you did it. I did it. You moved past it. January 31st, the following year, it was October 17th of 2018 that we purchased it. It was January 31st of 2019 that the food license was put in in my name. And we were able to, um, you know, have Blonzi's menus and change the sign out front to Blonzi. And 
um, and really start to to do our own thing. It took a year. Um, it took a whole year to get successful. That first year, 2019, we were bringing down money just to keep the doors open. Every every month, we had to bring down money to keep the doors open, yeah. and and it was pretty discouraging. Um, and working long hours and scary, trying, I'm mm-hmm, sure. and scary. yeah, and trying to get the the community to give us a chance for being different. The Golden Horseshoe was only open for dinner. Their menu was their big thing was a salad bar. They had this huge salad bar and that was what they did well I don't do salad bars I rest I've never worked at a restaurant with a salad bar um most of them aren't around anymore because of like the pandemic shows you know it's not safe you got to keep full cold food cold and hot food hot in a certain hour you changed the menu Mm -hmm. you changed everything that everyone was used Mm -hmm. to (laughs) I did all the the things that they say not to do um yeah I pissed off all the locals by taking away the beloved salad bar and I really, um, and it really tried hard to make sure that the salads were big and good and super cold and they had all the things, you know, the tomato, the cucumber, the lettuce, the, the carrot, the onion, just all of it on the one plate um, to make sure that we had like the best dinner salads in like how soon and, yeah. um, and tried to overcome that. And it took, it took a year, the whole year, 2019, we weren't successful. January, 2020 was our first big successful year so and big first month that we we made money so january february 2020 we're kicking butt we're doing so good and then Corona. the apocalypse <laughs> yes so yes. feeling like you're getting your feet in people are coming you've kind of built a relationship with i'm sure people in the community mm-hmm. positivity was happening you have your kids working for you as well yes. this is a family-owned business um woman ran Mm-hmm. You fought all the challenges. One of my daughters actually um, rented out her house. My my children are all homeowners, and she uh, they, all, they all three worked for me at the time, and she rented her house out and and moved to Lake Havasu, and she started to run the restaurant with me and for me while I wasn't there for a year and a half. She was here. And at this point, you're going back and forth, really monitoring and you know keep track of both spaces, living living the dream, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's we f- I fly every four days between the two restaurants usually, um, and I have a pretty much regular schedule now, but but constantly flying back and forth. There was a lot of times where I would stay in like Havasu, or my husband would go back to Oregon, and it, it was it was a lot of hours um, and learning the dynamics and, and you know, the whole, um, the social media aspect too was different. Uh, we don't have in Salem, we don't have, a um, orchid and onion page. I didn't know what that was. And in like Havasu with the thing, um, they, they give you onions if they don't like you and they give you orchids if they do like you. And, oh, and Lord. it's, it's <laughs> a lot of pressure. <laughs> it was, it was, it was different. I, I had never, um, had that kind of criticism before and, um, opposition. It was, because in Salem, everyone was so welcoming and yeah, so excited, right? And they come to see this one, and and then here in Havasu, it was um, it was just so different. It was yeah. it was a battle, uh, but eventually, you know, we got through it and and we made it successful. And then and then the apocalypse happened, um, and we lost both restaurants. The Oregon restaurant was shut down first. Um, I didn't believe that that they could do that. I didn't know. I didn't understand that the governor had that much power that the governor could just hold a press conference and I could lose my lifetime's worth of work in a two minute press conference. I had no idea. I didn't, I didn't believe it and yeah. called my sister crying. Like she can't do that. Like, and what do do and yeah, my sister said, yeah, she can. The CDC has spoken. They, they, you're done. You got to close. And cause I didn't want to. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't understand. Um, so I learned a lot. You not only have one business, you have two. Right. And in totally different places in the United States, you know, um, Oregon, uh, unfortunately the pandemic was very political, which we all know now. Um, yeah. but to me, an illness didn't seem like it should be political. So I didn't, I didn't understand the, that, the um, logic. right. And the dynamics of the two, um, Oregon is extremely liberal and like Havasu is very conservative. So, um, the Oregon shut down. I, I lost, you know, a lot of money in food, 30 grand in food. I gave it to all my employees. And um, and then I came down to Lake Havasu. And on the 25th, I believe, of March, uh, the, the governor, Ducey, said the same thing. Restaurants are closed. 
So we did the same thing, gave away all the food and to the employees and uh, tried to regroup. Um, like I had a whole week where I didn't work during that whole week and I got to come up with a plan. I referred to the restaurants, uh, the Lake Havasu restaurant as the baby and the Oregon restaurant as the responsible teenager. <laughs> the Oregon restaurant I could leave for a week at a time, you know, give them some extra cash for pizza, whatever, they're fine. They're doing good. But but the baby, um, you know, are they when you, whenever I get on the plane and leave, you know, are they are they taking care of her? Are they cleaning her? Are they right. you know, are they feeding her right? You know, that's 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 how it felt to me. I've so vested in both of them that it felt like visitation between the two. Yeah. And and actually we know I had one daughter at one and one daughter at the other, so it, <laughs> it kinda was that way. And my son my son as well. Um, he was a cook at the Oregon restaurant. Um, two of my children during the pandemic, um, after the Oregon restaurant got shut down the second time, they got out of the industry. They uh, no longer Scary. work at the restaurants because they they don't have uh, faith uh, that they wanted a job that was essential. Yeah. And that nobody could take away from them. And that was, you know, putting your employees on unemployment is one thing. Putting your kids on unemployment is another and that was the most out of control um, I think I've ever felt about uh, anything. It was it was brutal. Um, but I thought, well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna reopen this Arizona restaurant on Easter Sunday. I'm gonna rise up and I'm gonna try again. I'm gonna do to go orders. Yeah. And uh, and I'm I actually called the health inspector and I asked, you know, what are the rules for to go orders? Because in Oregon they gave us you know, pages of rules, mm -hmm. um, but here. They said, well, we don't know yet. And I was like, okay. And I put her on speakerphone. I had my manager there with a pencil to write, to write down anything that she said. I was like, okay, well, um, when you know, how will I know? Are you going to send me an email? Are you going to come to the restaurant? Are you going to call me? You know, how will I know when you know what the rules are? And she said, well, we don't have a protocol for that. Oh. Okay. Okay. So I just sit here? Well, I'll just, <laughs> I said, you know what? I'll just thank you. We're all in this together. It's, you know, I totally understand. I'll just do my own research. So then I start researching, you know, what are other people doing for to-go orders? Because they don't have rules here. So I don't know what the rules are. So I'm just going to kind of do what everyone else Wing is it. doing. Yeah. Right. And I saw that Sonic was open. Sonic is a restaurant where customers sit in the parking lot and eat in their cars. Like, perfect. And then I saw that there was some restaurants on the Phoenix Fox 10 News that had put a movie screen up in front of their restaurant they were having drive-in movie theater night and i was like awesome so yeah let's, so let's have a uh, right i didn't have the license and you like a, i didn't know how theaters. that worked with the movie thing but but i thought okay well i can invite them to come and eat in the parking lot like um and i so i did i created a taco cruise day and i and on a tuesday where you could come down and sit in your cars and tailgate and eat tacos I mean, they weren't All going to, spaced out. right. It's Everyone a huge three it. acres. Right. Yeah. And they weren't going to other people's cars. They were staying in their own little area there, you know? Yeah. So, um, April 21st of 2020, um, the health inspector came in at 5 30 PM, very angry, yelling, screaming. You can't do that. You can't put on Facebook. The customers can eat in their cars in the, in the parking lot. And, I said, yes, I can. I'm in complete compliance. All the food's to go. And he said, no, I'm, you got to shut this down. And I said, no, I'm not shutting it down. And I wasn't doing anything wrong because I did my homework first. And I knew I wasn't doing anything wrong. And he said, I'm going to go get the sheriff. And he left. And he went and got the sheriff, deputy, and they, he came back with another inspector. And the more that I tried to defend myself, the more it escalated until they said not one bite of food was allowed to be eaten on my property. Um, not one bite of food in the parking lot. And that... Um, and they said that they wouldn't leave the land until every customer was gone. Talk about making a scene, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were people there. Um, I also did have it on video. Yeah. Um, and uh, I closed my doors over what happened that night. Um, I, I literally boarded up the doors. And um, I did release the video. And it went out there. And I... Uh, went to Oregon and reopened the Oregon restaurant and sold tacos to cops in the parking lot to go. And um, I reported what happened to me to the United States Justice Department and the Arizona State Justice Department. And I demanded a formal apology. I felt that um, basically, you know, your kid throws a rock and breaks a neighbor's window. How do you handle that situation? 
Take him over there. I take, apologize. Yeah. Work. Yeah. I take the kid by the hand. I make him apologize. That's what I wanted from them. Um, I felt like I had a choice to make that day that I'm either going to change the business or change the town. I'm, I can turn it into boat storage or something like that. Yeah. It's a heck of a lot easier to make money off of boat storage than it is off of slinging chicken fried steaks. Right. Like, why is this so right. hard? Um, <laughs> so, or, or I'm going to change... I'm going to change the town. I'm going to put a big old spotlight on the corruption. I wanted to know who was behind sending the health inspector down there. You know, was it another restaurant? Was it somebody that tried to buy this? Who is that? Who who sent him here? Yeah. Um, that's what I really wanted to know and why. Um, and the attorneys uh, took care of all of that and, and found out who and why. And, well, not really why, but I did find out who. Yeah. And it was from the county within. And... Um, you know, definitely suing the health inspector is not something you want to do as a restaurant owner. Um, no. But also, you know, if nobody stands up, then nobody stands up. Right. Well, um, as we've learned today, it's not a challenge doesn't scare you. It might be hard. You might cry. You might pray. But you went to work, and you did your due diligence and made it all work. And Blondie's is still there. Still standing. And now we're just working on the glass box right. for outside yes. of Blondie's. Yes. Um, the building permit will be obtainable now. We've, it was the first few times that we went, we got different, you know, well, you need this and this and this. But, but I totally understand because they didn't really know how to permit it. It's yeah. not, it's so unique and it's just so unusual. Um, so now now they know how to permit it we need to come back next time we go back we need a total cost because uh, they base here they base the permit on how much the building costs um which seems to fluctuate a lot Everywhere, too I'm sure. <laughs> on all the different things so it's pretty difficult to get an exact amount because um, then you go and get a bid and by the time you get the last bid then the first bid isn't valid anymore so um so there was just a couple things left that we need and then um and then we can begin the construction on that. Well, let's just be honest. By restaurant number three, you're going to have this all pretty dialed in, my friend. I'm hoping so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> restaurant number three is, is when we'll franchise after the third location. Um, then, that, I mean, that's the ultimate goal. That's what the dream is about. I do have franchise attorneys, which are uh, helping me in the process. I'm also doing another... A side gig we bought a limousine oh yeah you know Jeff, we have that picture will you show that picture <laughs> this, so the and limousine this will be go out of right to. yeah, yeah. Uh, and it goes to laughlin too um so there that's something i don't have it on me uh, it's weird you gotta i, I did you gotta hustle in havasu to get the customers to come um it's because we're kind of we're out there on the north end of town kind of by ourselves all the big boys are down by the by the bridge you know they're on restaurant row there and i'm yeah. i'm out by myself on the north end of town so i really i gotta come up with something and so um, the limo will actually take you up to law right cruise. right so the um there's a cpa and insurance guy and attorney right now that are setting up the the business of the limousine the the limousine will be packages so the customer that orders the limousine will each package will include blonzies somewhere in the package so there's a laughlin loop where that will take them from their house to the restaurant, feed them, and then take them to Laughlin to gamble or to sightsee or whatever, and then bring them back. We have a couple boat tours, um, so I've teamed up with some boat captains where the uh, limousine will pick you up at your house and will take you down to the lake, and you'll go out on the either the tiki boat, the pontoon tiki boat, or you'll go on a smaller um, pontoon boat, and, the, and we've got different tours, you know, the lighthouse tour, the um, up to Parker or down, um, or to Topak, you know, that way. Mm -hmm. um, so there's... Uh, different tours that the, the guests can do there and then when we bring them back to the restaurant we'll pick them up from the dock again and then bring them back to the restaurant and take um, feed them then and then take them home um, we have a special room in the restaurant we had a gift shop that we turned into that the previous owner had just used it for storage and then we had it as a gift shop for a while now it's going to be the vip room so anybody that comes in on the limousine will have the option of having this private room to themselves um, and there you know there's champagne brunch package there's a chef's tables package I've got like 10 different packages. Um, also just learned that when the limousine crosses over to like Havasu City, then we owe the like, Havasu City tax. And when it goes to Parker, we'll owe Parker City tax. And when it goes to <laughs> Laughlin, we'll owe Laughlin City tax and Nevada State City, city tax or Nevada State tax. So, um, so these are the things I didn't know because I'm restaurant girl, you know, yeah. so that's why I have the CPAs and the attorneys um, and the 
uh, insurance people all working together and they don't always agree so last week they had a they got in a the CPA said this thing and the insurance person said this thing so I actually called the attorney and said hey I need you to figure out <laughs> which what one <laughs> which one which what way we're gonna do? go because um, you know it's just that uh, the LLCs and the S corps and this uh, this business is going to be a partnership so it's it's different, different. also than the other uh, businesses that we have so uh, and there's a lot of rules with the the car thing you know and then yeah. then you've got alcohol to think about you know if if one of the like the Parker one, it goes to a casino. So we have to make sure that uh, that nobody in the limousine is a minor because we're going to be. So there's some packages with pub crawls, you know. So there's no minors allowed on those, and and other things like like guns. You know, I'm obviously yeah. I was raised on the rifle range. I um, I very feel very strong about the right to bear arms. However, I don't want the guests packing. Yeah, packing out. Oh, there's there's some, some of your trophies. There's some of the awards. Yeah, so I don't I don't want the people in the limousine to be you know with a with a weapon. So yeah. um, so that's something that we have to you know write into the contracts. And so we're learning. I'm just learning. It's a lot of learning. Yeah. Uh, so well, we're, I'm gonna say that it is safe to say that your journey does not stop here, and I'm excited to uh, invite you back. Maybe we, you. we'll get you back in another year or so and see where what you've done and how you've grown. Um, because I don't doubt that that is going to happen. Well, I thank am you so, so much. happy for you being here today and sharing you. your story. Um, you inspired me, and I'm sure that you will inspire many with this and everything that you are continually to do. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Shop local, support local, guys. Have a good day. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you.